Welcome back to the Carl Crusher channel. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into the connection of fast walkers, skin walkers, Mount Wilson Ranch, and the claims of recovered metamaterials that are going around. Recently, we've got interviews with uh, Ross Colthart claiming that he knows the exact location where a giant UFO is buried underground that is so big that they can't move it. And so there's outside of the United States, an entire installation or structure built over top of this UFO underground, but he will not say or release yet where that location is. I've also recently discovered a book written by Jacques Vallée that was published in 1999 when he was up at Mount Wilson Ranch just a few years earlier. And this entire fictional book seems like a story about his experiences at Mount Wilson, where it talks about fighter pilots witnessing UFOs going in and out of the bottom of a big mountain in Nevada near Area 51 and how this crew sneaks back inside this base in order to try and retrieve meta material and they witness an entire craft flying saucer inside a secret military installation in the bottom of a mountain it sounds exactly like a retelling of his time at mount wilson ranch and the dates line up and everybody there it's pretty wild so we're going to go back all the way to joe rogan and an initial interview with jeremy corbell when he had Bob Lazar on there, and it's going to tie all of this together. There is a ranch in Nevada, less than 80 miles from Area 51, that was secretly researched by Bob Bigelow's original Skinwalker Ranch team of psychic spies. For decades, while simultaneously researching Skinwalker Ranch, the NIDS team was searching for the lost entrance into a giant cave system of ancient alien artifacts, an abandoned alien mining operation leading to a 500-foot underground pyramid hiding a ufo nicknamed the mount wilson manta ray for thousands of years indigenous people have known and protected its secrets for decades top secret government teams even before ronald reagan's star wars program were scouring the ranch attempting to recover the meta materials biological material and ancient unknown artifacts and were stopped by an explosion of paranormal activity animal mutilations alien abductions poltergeist activity, moving orbs of light and shadow figures, strange glitches in time, and the ghost of a Native American shaman appearing along with three extraterrestrial beings who protect the land. Now, new leaked whistleblower evidence has confirmed the truth behind these local legends. New ancient artifacts are being discovered and mysterious energy is transmitting from the meadow and an undiscovered tunnel entrance has been found. Independent researchers, scientists, archaeologists, and Native American historians have joined me, Carl Crusher, to uncover the truth. We are on a mission to find the lost entrance into the underground and uncover the real mystery of Mount Wilson Ranch. Guys, welcome back to Skinwalker Ranch. I know when you left, you had some uh, exciting things that you wanted to go and explore. And we're really excited to see what you may have come up with. This one's a little bit different because Brandon has actually set us up with an outside investigator. Yeah, an investigator named Carl Andreessen. Carl is a guy who's been working on a place called Mount Wilson Ranch in Nevada. And he's really been trying to dig into the high strange that's going on there. And there's a lot. So where is Mount Wilson Ranch? So we're about 80 miles from Area 51 and near the Nevada test range. Yes, sir. Range. Right on top of it. And we're not quite sure exactly where the boundary is because it's yeah. a very rural part of Nevada. Well, that brings me to the question then, what can you tell us about the interest? Like what's the commonality with the, with the research that's gone on here? The connection between Mount Wilson and this place is pretty extraordinary. It's another property that Bob Bigelow owned really at the same time as Skinwalker. Aerospace entrepreneur Robert Bigelow owned Skinwalker Ranch before Brandon Fugel. In 1996, Robert Bigelow bought Skinwalker Ranch, and his team conducted a very aggressive scientific investigation. The Bigelow team ended up having all sorts of strange things happen. They started seeing everything from electromagnetic anomalies, cattle mutilations, it involves the full gamut of unexplained phenomena that we continue to monitor. 
It has only recently been learned that Robert Bigelow was conducting a similar investigation at Mount Wilson Ranch. Yeah, so we've got some archival images that show Bigelow on this ranch. The main thing that was of interest to Bigelow was that he suspected there was a crashed or downed UFO underground a portion of the ranch. Okay. Yeah, what we don't know is what kind of testing Bigelow carried out there or, or what they found, what of any of their results or research. Yeah. And we're talking about the congressional hearings and these whistleblower testimonies from David Grush claiming that there is metamaterials recovered that are currently being studied and researched, reverse engineered in some of these compartmentalized programs within the military and the United States government to try and rebuild, reverse engineer, UFOs, flying saucer, and extraterrestrial craft. But some interesting things keep coming up as a theme. When you go back to the story at Mount Wilson Ranch, and when you listen to the claims of Bob Lazar and the UFO that he claims he saw at Area 51, it all fits in with this book written by Jacques Belay, who was also at Mount Wilson Ranch in Nevada and Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, that these came from archeological digs. The UFO that Bob Lazar talks about on the Joe Rogan podcast with Jeremy Corbell, he actually states that this came from an archaeological dig. And the book Fast Walker by Jacques Vallée takes place at an archaeological dig that was previously researched in the 1940s and before the Star Wars program and the MX missile program with Ronald Reagan clear back in the 1940s, there was a discovery at what they call in the book Pyramid Mountain. Uh, in the base of the mountain, they recover alien material or metamaterials, and it kicks off this entire program uh, of reverse engineering this stuff at Area 51 and various compartmentalized programs. After that, these groups come back up to Mount Wilson Ranch and they go back into the mountain and they regain access to continue to do the same thing. The whole thing sounds like it fits together like a giant puzzle piece, so let's see if we can unravel it. There's going to be a lot of different characters involved, so try and keep track of the names and the faces, and I'll do the best that I can with all the overlays and the videos. But let's go back to the history of Mount Wilson Ranch, going clear back to ancient indigenous times. There's a lot of legends and rumors that Area 51 is built on the dry lake bed at Groom Lake because there is something already underground there. Maybe they discovered some kind of ancient artifacts, citadel entrance, or technology that was already underground and that could have kicked off an entire program of searching the United States and the surrounding area in Nevada for other evidence. All around Area 51, we find ancient petroglyphs that go back 6,000 to 10,000 years, maybe older. They fit in with the stories around Lovelock Cave that have to do with ancient giants. These are giant people that used to roam the land that the Native Americans used to have to fight and battle with to keep their villages safe. There's a lot of speculation about the interpretation of the ancient petroglyphs and how they connect with the migration route all the way down to Montezuma and those trade routes that we know came all the way up and even brought maize and corn up into the southern states of the United States. But the ancient petroglyphs and the stories revolving around them a lot of the times have to do with the communication with the star people. These were deities that came down on silver feathers from the sky or the heavens and also came up out of almost dimensional portals from the earth and communicated with the indigenous Native American people to teach them about culture, uh, rituals, and their own belief systems and way of life. And a lot of the petroglyphs seem to depict this not only around Area 51, but across the entire desert southwest, all the way up and around Skinwalker Ranch. The Native Americans that lived at Mount Wilson Ranch during the summertime would migrate down to Alamo and right near the edge of Area 51, if not Broom Lake itself, in the wintertime. And the artifacts that we have found and that the owner, Jeff McBurney, has found at Mount Wilson Ranch have been phenomenal. We're talking about exquisite eight to 10 inch long spearheads made of this like zebra striped obsidian that is translucent in the light and then opaque when you hold it down in the shadow. And these are seemingly ceremonial deposits that are put around the ranch indicating that for potentially thousands of years, ancient indigenous people 
have considered Mount Wilson a sacred and ritual location. Not to mention we find these stone circles on evidence of ritual sites and dwelling there that could have been used for ceremonies that seem to indicate that they were doing rituals in alignment with the stars or the heavens and not just using these stone structures for shelter. We'll see what's... Whoa, dude, what is this? Look at that. That's uh, Everything's buggy right now. The whole system's kind of crashing. Rotate a little bit out of the glare for me, if you don't mind. It's just the whole thing's glitched. Here we go. Yeah, it's, it's a little buggy. What's that? I can't it's, hear you. It is a little buggy. I'm recording data. It's just... Oh, it's still gone. Accessing it is... It's... <laughs> it's strong. Here, it can be forward. Yeah, there's... I mean, there's... I mean, yeah, it's it's twice as strong as it was down in the meadow in very within a hertz. Wait, twice as strong? Yeah, I mean, within a hertz. It's 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 all right, right in those. Well, also, how come within the circle, just five feet away, is drastically different yeah. than right over there? Yeah, Why? It's different. Standing in the circle is way different. It's, it's different. That's creepy. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's also glitching the computer out of there. So. The whole computer is glitching. Oh, I don't even like standing in here, honestly. <laughs> so. <laughs> Maybe you're glitching too. I don't, <laughs> right? Probably. <laughs> Probably. We'll, we'll know by what happens uh, if you make it down the mountain. Later. Yeah, we'll We're find still out. Still not quite sure yet, but the evidence seems to indicate that this place was used for dwelling, habitation. They made food. They lived here for a long time, and it could go clear back to the Clovis period. So, what is it about Mount Wilson Ranch that ancient indigenous people and Native Americans for thousands of years would have come there? for to deposit their ceremonial spearheads and arrowheads and things like that to consider this place very special and sacred to them. What's also interesting is that the owner of the ranch, Jeff, also found an esoteric sort of ritual initiation sword. Now we have figured out and researched out with the help of Museum of Tarot, um, Brent Stone, that this sword that Jeff found at Mount Wilson belongs to a group called the Knights of Pythias. The Knights of Pythias are a group similar to the Freemasons that do esoteric initiations and rituals and it's like a fraternal order. And there was a group down in Del Mar that seemed to be doing this back at the turn of the 1800s into the 1900s. And so there's this interesting time period where we figured out that this sword probably belonged to a group around the 1930s that puts them also up there considering Mount Wilson and this location very interesting for their rituals or initiations. And once we uh, get the archaeologists there to open that sword, we might even be able to find out that there's a name on the blade and if it's a Rockefeller or something, it could add some intriguing uh, details historically as to who was there at Mount Wilson Ranch and why beyond just the evidence that there was mining and tunneling going on for a long time. A lot of the information that we uncover about these types of ritual swords for Freemasons and Knights of Pythias is that if they're left out on a mountain or a hillside or near an old mining operation, it could have to do with the burial. So whatever name could be on the blade of the sword, there could also be a burial up there associated with where the sword was found. And so some of that we're still kind of keeping private until we do the research and figure out more facts about that. But we have more videos and series where we're going to go and follow up on the sword and find out what were those people doing there and why and what did they know maybe they had old maps you know you hear about the spaniard the spaniards the conquistadors the freemasons the templars all these different groups seem to have secret information or maps that they go by that the rest of us don't normally get to see and when you start to think like they think and find their evidence it gets really intriguing. I should also mention that we have found evidence that there could be a Spanish cart path, a hand placed stone pathway that goes back over the mountain to a cairn and some abandoned mines with some also indigenous structures. It looks like there's a matate stone inside these little stone structures near these old mines. They seem like they're so small that they would only be for like hobbit sized people. So it doesn't make very much sense, but this could be a long time ago. The hand placed stones of this like roadway or pathway 
would have been used for hand carts or maybe the Spanish, maybe some older culture that we don't even know about. There's no historical records about this road. In the late 1800s, there was a settler's cabin and some initial structures and camps set up at Mount Wilson right down in the lower meadow. The initial people that came up there and settled at Mount Wilson Ranch started prospecting and mining the area. And the local stories go that as they dug and tunneled in and prospected, they did several test holes that they went into the underground and they didn't find what they were looking for. Or one of the stories is that they did run into something deep in the earth. As they started to tunnel, they accessed these lava tubes or some kind of a tunnel system that was already existing, maybe left behind by the indigenous people. And the miners got down into this tunnel system and ran into something that absolutely terrified them. The story goes that they abandoned the mine, sealed it off and tried to hide it. Historically, there isn't much known about Mount Wilson Ranch after that until the new owner, Jeff McBurney, buys it from Robert Bigelow. Since then, we've been able to uncover that the MX missile program in the very earliest days of the Star Wars program, right after World War II, clear back in the 1940s, was at Mount Wilson Ranch, and they claim to have had an archeological team doing research up there, digging for something underground. Some of the stories say that they were looking for ancient indigenous artifacts, but that doesn't make sense to our evidence because when we go there, we still find arrowheads, spearheads, matate stones, and all of that, that if it was a team of archeologists up at Mount Wilson Ranch, it doesn't make sense that they left all that there, didn't document it, and didn't seem to be interested in the Native American artifacts at all. But there is a lot of tunneling and a lot of evidence that there was mining and digging underground. This fits in exactly with what we get in Jacques Vallée's book called Fast Walker, where he references a story from the 1940s where there's a group of archaeologists or a team that was sent by the government to a mountain in Nevada, and they were doing an archaeological assignment. They ran into these UFOs, fast walkers that were coming in and out of the base of a mountain, they gained access, got metamaterials and even bodies or biological materials, and then they closed off the tunnel system, evacuated the area, and then everything goes quiet until the Star Wars program under Ronald Reagan, followed up by Bob Bigelow coming in there with his entire team. The late afternoon was dragging down the autumn sun, casting an orange glow around the desert mountains of Nevada. The jagged, sharply delineated hills looked forbidding to the two pilots who had been ordered to search for an elusive target that was troubling the ground-based radar at Nellis Air Force Base. Locking it in the double circles of his collimator. That's it! But his exuberance was soon tempered by the sight of a jagged mountain range with a high peak shaped like a huge pyramid coming up in front of him. Jesus, it's gonna crack up, it's gonna burn! He continued to film the thing in front of him and braced for the explosion as the disc reached the mountain at top speed. But there was no explosion, just a glow an intense display of light turning to a brilliant series of colored beams that burst into the sky. They came from a point at the foot of the mountain range and extended into the atmosphere with a shimmering effect. The beams encircled the object. Captain Hall pulled hard on the stick and barely skimmed over the peak. Exhaling with relief, he looked up and saw something that astounded him. There was no sign of the target he had been pursuing. It was as if the craft had been swallowed up by the mountain. For a second, he thought he had seen the rocky slope open into a gigantic cavern and close up again. Hopefully you're keeping up. This is a lot of history. The stories go that when this team of archeologists from California were up at Mount Wilson Ranch, when they started digging underground, the local stories go that they also had an outpouring of paranormal activity. Suddenly the ghost of this shaman, a Native American supposedly appeared outside of one of the homes there and scared the archeologists. This all of a sudden kicked off a bunch of events where the locals and one of the caretakers of the property, uh, Donna Bardeen, also claimed that they saw three extraterrestrials that looked like these goblin figures that would appear at Mount Wilson Ranch, that would appear outside of her car, and there was several abduction and communication experiences that unfolded during this period. This also exactly fits the stories from Jacques Vallée's book, Fast Walker, where he talks about a character right in the opening scenes of that book that sounds like it comes right out of the mouth of Donna Bardeen driving down the road at Mount Wilson Ranch that I've heard dozens of times. She looked up and saw a huge metal disc. 
the engine died. Rachel found herself gasping for breath as the car rolled silently down the road. She hit the brakes, bringing the vehicle to a jarring stop, and she frantically tried to restart it. The engine gave off a series of stifled coughs, but didn't come to life. The glowing disc was silently descending over the road and kicking up dust about 25 yards ahead. It was hovering a few inches above the asphalt, gently rocking to and fro. It spanned both lanes. A wall of light drifted between the object and the car. It seemed that someone was drawing a white curtain of undulating fog in front of Rachel. And now, several goblin-like figures with oddly oversized heads were walking toward the little car. Rachel felt frozen. She wanted to lock the doors, but was shocked to discover that her arm, her whole body, had become warm and heavy, too heavy for her to complete the motion. Physically, it wasn't an unpleasant sensation. Psychologically, it was terrifying. The little men surrounded the car. They pressed their misshapen, chalk-white faces against the glass, hairless heads dominated by huge, depthless, sad black eyes seemed to be everywhere. One of the grotesque dwarves appeared to be the leader. He pointed a glowing, rod-like device at her. Rachel screamed. In Jacques Vallée's book, he places the story under different names, but it's like he mixes the names around from Colm Kelleher to the different people, and he just switches the names around. But it's the same time period. Jacques Vallée was up there with Bob Bigelow and that whole team in 1996, and his Fast Walker book came out in 1999. They seem to be having trouble with the Fast Walker again, Greg Parker reported. They're backing up all the computers at Pyramid Base. In the darkened Allentel room, the group had reached a decision point. Bushnell and the man on the screen they called Vulcan were debating whether or not to proceed with the next phase of their operation, and now some critical data seemed to be missing. The prize was control, Greg reminded himself. Not just control of America, but long-term control of the planet. And Allentel had the fast walker. So why continue the charade? Why the elaborate games? Wouldn't it be simpler to tell the people the truth right now? Parker's eyes went back to the display on the workstation in front of him. The group was waiting for his next words. If I'm reading this right, the fast walker has stopped generating detectable magnetic effects. It's become inert, except for surface phenomena which resemble very fast cell convection. What you say doesn't make any sense, said Vulcan sharply. Surely you realize we're dealing with a nuts and bolts craft weighted at over a hundred tons. The physics group reports the object has gone to a dark phase, sir. Its effective temperature has reached 15 degrees centigrade. The striking aspect of the base was the sheer complexity of the sounds she heard. A mammoth underground structure was laid out below her, its dark, far wall only faintly outlined behind a jumble of machinery. But it was the noise that overwhelmed her. There was a whirlwind of activity directly before them. Dozens of scientists and military men moved about in intense preparation for something huge. Workers in blue berets were unloading dozens of items from the train. Lead shields, titanium blocks, test tubes filled with various preparations, steel bars, huge mirrors. They carried a large plexiglass tank holding a blue liquid and a screeching chimpanzee in a cage. To their right was the most magnificent sight of all, a grounded saucer a hundred feet in diameter, silvery gray in color, with an occasional glint of gold. The sound that came from it was a high-pitched melody that followed none of the known laws of music. The craft's surface shimmered under the spotlights as if it were spinning rapidly. The disc had a superstructure like a cupola on its upper shell with pulsing colors that resolved into successive levels of blue, red, and green. Its physical shape seemed to change ever so slightly from minute to minute, defying perspective, inducing a mild sense of vertigo in anyone who watched it. This alternate aspect of the MX missile program or the Star Wars program split off and became focused around the funding that came from MK Ultra into this new shift of uh, extrasensory perception. And that's when we have Hal Putoff, Bob Bigelow, and Tim Ryan, 
We've got Colm Kelleher, Jacques Vallée, Shelley Wadsworth, Eric Davis, and a lot of interesting characters suddenly getting involved in this project up at Mount Wilson Ranch. Before that, there's even evidence that potentially Howard Hughes was up there and an owner of the property doing some kind of experiments and research. And maybe he was the one that brought in the army barracks that are down there in the lower meadow and some of the other installations, including the redecorating and fancy stuff that you find up in the main buildings in the saloon. Howard Hughes, one of his main partners and contractors out of Nevada was listed as the property owner, but it's possible that that's just a cover because Howard Hughes is the real owner. He may have put in the airport and the runway right there in the town. And all of it seems to add up that possibly Howard Hughes was even there. Most of you are going to be familiar with Robert Bigelow as the owner of Skinwalker Ranch. A lot of people don't realize at the same time as he owned Skinwalker Ranch, he also owned Mount Wilson Ranch. We've got several whistleblower leaked photographs of Bob Bigelow standing in the lodge, in the saloon, in front of what we call the shaman room and also down in the meadow with all of his colleagues. He's also up at the ponds, at the lakes, and obviously doing research with a team of individuals. We've slowly gone down through these pictures and figured out who these individuals are and the list of patents and funding and where it comes from is deep. Right in those photographs is Jacques Vallée, famous UFO researcher who the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind was really based off of in Steven Spielberg. And we get even a joke and a mention of that in the Bob Lazar interview with Joe Rogan some aerospace company something i don't know yeah they wouldn't they would the guy the admiral wouldn't name it in the car right. in the conversation right. yeah so they still have these things supposedly i would guess i mean i don't have any information on have you ever all. asked anyone that has any inkling of any idea of where they got them or how they got them no but um something must have been said to me um from barry and but I, I it was just too long ago and I, I can't quite remember what was said, but it it just left a seed in my mind. I think at least one of them was part of an archaeological dig. So it's old. Something one at least one of them is old. I don't know if it was the one I worked on, but I remember something to do with an archaeological dig. Whoa. So that's uh that means it's not just old, it's ancient. That'd be a great Steven Spielberg movie. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> As all of it would. Yeah. Yeah. Four years ago in this podcast with Joe Rogan, Jeremy Corbell, and Bob Lazar, they talk about the Wilson Davis memo. They reference Bob Bigelow, Skinwalker Ranch, the recovered meta material. And Bob Lazar talks about the UFO that he saw and was studying coming from an archaeological dig that could be really, really old. And then they even joke about that would make a really good Steven Spielberg movie, which is a reference to Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which is a movie based based off of the French scientist Jacques Vallée. And it all seems like these dots connect all the way back to Mount Wilson Ranch. So let's get back to this photo where we have Bob Bigelow standing in Mount Wilson Ranch right there in the parking lot with his team. And we don't even know everybody in the photo. We don't know exactly who's even holding the camera. But Bob Bigelow is the head of Bigelow Aerospace and the owner of Skinwalker Ranch. And in this photograph, he's currently the owner of Mount Wilson Ranch. In an interview recently with Jeremy Mishlove, he said this. And one of the things I didn't even know about you is that there was a second ranch, the Wilson Ranch. And for all I know, additional properties as well. Yeah, well, um, when I first started to uh, do ET UFO research, I personally interviewed about 235 people, just myself and the experiencer. And most of those interviews were in the area between Caliente, uh, Panaca, and Pioche. And then the Mount Wilson Ranch uh, was in line with that. And the more people I interviewed, <clears throat> the more it was obvious that events were happening down that up and down that corridor. And the Mount Wilson Ranch was part of that corridor. And so I thought, well, it could be an interesting laboratory. And so that's why I bought it. And, um, and then I had some really good um, 
interviews with people very close. I didn't pay any attention to something at a, at a real distance, you know, unless it was huge uh, football stadium size. But if it were, you know, a couple miles, a mile or two away, it didn't matter. That didn't, that didn't count. That wasn't, I wanted stuff that was literally in your face or chasing you in your car, you know, or you're sitting outside the, the restaurant and uh, you're seeing this literally football stadium uh, craft drifting across your town, you know, and uh, so <clears throat> those are really interesting accounts and the skinwalker ranch uh, had a, a log house there that uh, was a, about 1875 vintage and it had a a a, a, a saloon like you would see at Osbury farm you mean the wilson ranch uh, so, i'm sorry the wilson ranch yeah um, the wilson ranch and uh so the wilson ranch had a house about 1875 in terms of its age and the back bar came around i think they said cape horn and also at about that same time for this uh, Nosberry Farm looking saloon that they had built there. They had built a saloon with other ancillary kinds of, you know, like a, like a uh, little restaurant area and a commercial kitchen and so forth. And, um, and then a little motel that they had there. Um, and so interesting place, about 145 acres in size. Then there was the issue you and I spoke of, I guess it might have even been yesterday, of the uh, UFO that flew right into the mountain there. Yeah, yeah. I, I was uh, <clears throat> talking with these neighbors because there were quite a few other homes outside of the ranch. And <clears throat> so there were a group of them um, one night are looking up in the sky and this unidentified flying object, this UFO, is doing figure eights, right? And it keeps doing them and doing them. And so they stand there and they're watching this. And then it deviates dramatically and it shoots off at low altitude right into the mountain itself. But there's no explosion. It's just gone. So the guys get together the next day, the next morning, they hike up there to the mountain and they're looking for debris. They're looking for burnt shrub, you know, anything, trees, whatever. They find nothing, absolutely nothing. And that's, that's similar to the story uh, at the off the Skinwalker Ranch, there's a highway, and there's a uh, a mountain that that they had to cut in order to continue the highway. And it's not at that location; it might only be 75, 80 feet in height, something like that, seven or eight stories high. And we had a uh, we talked to uh, somebody that said they had seen it, a craft go right into that mountain and disappear. So not only do we have him in the photographs from the whistleblower that leaked to us, that he's there at Mount Wilson Ranch, and we know that that is a discovery, but that forces him to admit in the New Thinking Aloud interview with Jeremy Mishlove that he did own Mount Wilson Ranch, and that he did it because the UFOs there were as large as a football field, and they were going in and out of the base of a mountain. Bigelow also said that he used Mount Wilson Ranch as a laboratory, that it was a research site for him. And he was doing that simultaneously at the same time as owning Skinwalker Ranch. Colm Kelleher, who has a background in mad cow disease and was an integral part of the research at Skinwalker Ranch. You've got Shelly Wadsworth, who was like a scout for the Bigelow team, going and finding these spots that seem to have all of the stories from the locals that there's evidence of UFO activity. You have Jacques Ballet that wrote the book, Fast Walker, that sounds like a fictional retelling of everything they did, that this entire team did while they were at Mount Wilson Ranch. Behind him, and in all of these photos, you've got Hal Putoff. Hal Putoff is the individual at To The Stars Academy working with Tom DeLong right now that has the meta material. There was an interview on Coast to Coast AM with him and Eric Davis. The same Eric Davis from the Wilson Davis memo is was on Coast to Coast AM with Hal Putoff and they talked about handling and seeing this meta material. Where did they get the meta material from? How come they're talking about it on Coast to Coast AM and all the same players seems to be involved you have Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp sitting behind David Grush and Commander Fravor during the congressional hearings talking about recovered craft, biological material, and metamaterial. And it's like they're referencing Hal Putoff. 
Hal Putoff is the individual in these photos at Mount Wilson Ranch. And it's like all of these pieces are fitting together. It's even Jeremy Corbell and Bob Lazar that are referencing Bigelow in the Wilson Davis memo. And it's Eric Davis in the photos with Bigelow, Jacques Vallée, Hal Putoff, and all the rest of the gang. And they're at Mount Wilson Ranch. We have more photographic evidence and timeline evidence, including the fictional book Fast Walker that lines up with everything at Mount Wilson Ranch being the place where metamaterials were recovered more than anywhere else at this point. So tell me somebody who knows what the Dirac equation is, like a pretty low bar for a physicist. There is no one. And I don't quite mean no one, but do you know who Eric W. Davis is? No. You ever heard of the Wilson memo? No. Okay, there's something called the Wilson Memo where there's a physicist who meets an, a general or an admiral, and the general or the admiral is trying to figure out, I think this is an EG and G, um, why is there some program that I'm not allowed to know about? I have the highest clearances, I have a need to know. I'm like, sorry, we can't tell you. He's talking to somebody named Eric W. Davis. Eric W. Davis, so far as I can find, is the only person other than maybe Hal put off who I've been able to talk to who speaks anything of these languages. This is not a particularly famous physicist. Hal put off is an electrical engineer. I think a PhD in electrical engineering. Eric W. Davis says to me, I said, is, is there nobody out here who speaks physics? This doesn't make any sense. And he says, well, you Hal and I are the three most technical people on this. Joe, I'm not even on this. So you know as much about it as anyone, and you're not even involved. And there's only two other people that know <laughs> the science behind and, this? And, and like one of them is into remote viewing and, oh. and, and was a Scientologist. Um, so uh, physics knowledge held by aerospace companies that is not There known. certainly is materials knowledge. Materials, well, okay, material Which science. Which involves topological physics or whatever. That's Gary Knoll, Stanford microbiologist and Nobel nominee who claims to have UFO crash parts with isotope ratios that don't occur naturally on Earth. One of his pieces that we looked at together when I visited was magnesium bismuth. Bismuth layers less than the human hair, supposedly picked up in the crash retrieval of an advanced aerospace vehicle. Nowhere could we find any evidence that anybody ever made one of these. Not to mention, you've got Dr. Tim Ryan. I could go into him and all of his DARPA and Army and directed energy weapons funding and patents and non-lethal weapons, phased array EMPs, underground penetrating ultra low frequency radar systems and all of the patents. There was a lot more than $22 million that was going into Tim Ryan and all of his technology and patents as the owner of this company, Sarah, that was separate from the funding that Bigelow had to do the same kind of research. All of these guys had different compartmentalized budgets and funding that came together at Mount Wilson Ranch to follow up on all the stories that supposedly happened back in the forties. Alan Dell has, uh, Rapid deployment teams, blue berets, set up through the country, Colonel Trent said. When a real encounter takes place, they're assembled and ready to roll in minutes. Allentel knew that these craft were invading our airspace and taking people away, but we didn't have a clue as to where they were from or why they were here. A silence. Peter was dumbfounded. And then we, uh, we found some debris, Trent concluded. All broken up, but some of it still worked. It came crashing down in the desert. A rancher stumbled upon it. <laughs> 1947, right? New Mexico? I read about it. No, Pete, what you read was just the cover story. A blind alley. The real pieces were picked up the year before. Jesus, and you people have had all the answers for over 50 years? Wrong again, Pete. It was one piece of the puzzle but not the smoking gun. You see, we could never reassemble the thing. After years of trying in our labs, the hardware was taken from us and shipped somewhere else. We think it's in Nevada.
So historically, we have this entire chain of events all the way back into ancient indigenous times and esoteric groups, the MX missile program, the team of archaeologists, the Star Wars program under Ronald Reagan, Bigelow's entire team with that whole group of interesting people that are all up there researching Mount Wilson Ranch. Jacques Vallée writes the book Fast Walker about an alien structure underground with a UFO that they're trying to get access to to get metamaterials. How put off is that to the Stars Academy and goes on coast to coast AM claiming that he has metamaterials. And he's talking about this Wilson Davis memo talking about Eric Davis that was at Mount Wilson Ranch. All of Tim Ryan's patents and technology have to do with extracting metamaterials and scanning underground caves and tunnel system using ultra low frequency technology and phased array systems, which in season one of Beyond Skinwalker Ranch, when the History Channel came up and filmed with us, that's what we seem to have found with our magnetometer and ground penetrating radar data down in the lower meadow. Some kind of a phased array system used to monitor underground tunnel systems and also act like an EMP device in order to monitor or to capture and trap a UFO. And the one place that we've got photos of them all together is at Mount Wilson Ranch in Nevada, where Jacques Vallée wrote about in the book Fast Walker and in his own uh, personal journal. And all of this seems to fit together. Where did they get the meta material from? I think they got it from the abandoned underground tunnel system that was discovered in the 1940s by the original people that maybe the ancient indigenous Native Americans knew about and were accessing for their rituals and their special purposes. And later, there's generation after generation of ownership and teams from the MX Missile Program, the Star Wars Program, Bigelow's team, all the way up through that seemed like they were accessing something underground, this alien base like we heard about in the fictional, fictional book um, by Jacques Vallée, and that we also see similar stories football stadium sized craft coming in and out of the mountain, just like in the movie that's based on Jacques Ballet, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that they joke about on the Joe Rogan podcast about being a Steven Spielberg movie. It all fits together so much, it kind of boggles my mind that everybody isn't piecing it together by now. They don't know how the material was engineered or why or by whom. Now, some of this meta material was allegedly collected in connection with UFO incidents, which gives the whole endeavor another worldly glow. The I-Team's George Knapp has the story and the Las Vegas connection. For years, the Pentagon secretly studied the seemingly impossible abilities of unknown craft captured in these military videos. Scientists now want to know if the materials used in these mystery aircraft allow them to do what they do. For years, one of the secret studies was carried out by Bass, a Las Vegas operation hidden within Bigelow Aerospace. Documents first reported by the I-Team show that Bass landed a contract with the DIA, and one of the objectives was to study so-called metamaterials, as well as futuristic technologies. It was a multi-layered bismuth and magnesium sample. Bismuth layers less than a human hair. Magnesium samples about 10 times the size of a human hair supposedly picked up in the crash retrieval of an advanced aerospace vehicle. Uh, looks like it's been in a crash. In Las the Vegas back in June, physicist Hal Putoff came pretty close to saying that this weird wedge of metamaterial came from a crashed saucer, but he can't know for sure. Putoff and his colleague, Dr. Eric Davis, are on the cutting edge of attempts to identify an assortment of bits and pieces that are seemingly beyond anything we can create. This one sample is engineered in layers thinner than microns through a process unknown on Earth and for a purpose we can only guess. Nowhere could we find any evidence that anybody ever made one of these. When we talked to people who, in the materials field who should know, they said, we don't know why anybody would want to make anything like this. 
Astrophysicist Dr. Jacques Vallée has been analyzing mystery metals since the 80s, often using the technical expertise of Stanford University and Silicon Valley to unravel unknown samples acquired from all over the world. Vallée pointedly steers clear of any military funding, and he shared his findings at public conferences. We have multiple samples now from multiple sources, ranging a wide variety of, of, of integrity. These days, former intelligence officer Lou Elizondo helps to collect and protect unknown chunks for the To The Stars Academy. Before that, he ran ATIP, the Pentagon's secret UFO study, the same one which released the now famous videos. This summer, To The Stars launched Adam, its own effort to find and study pieces of material that may have been stashed away for decades after being retrieved from the sites of close encounters. Elizondo says there are legitimate reasons why the military and now private groups are in a race to figure out these materials. What our internal efforts are to potentially, potentially, I'm not saying we're doing this, maybe replicate that technology or to reverse engineer that technology, right? Now you're getting into some sensitivities that you don't necessarily want everybody to be privy to. George Knapp, 8 News Now. By the way, when the New York Times broke its story last year about the Pentagon's UFO study, it reported that a sample of mystery material was secretly stored at Bigelow Aerospace. Managers of that program told the I-Team that while they're familiar with some of the metamaterial samples, none were ever stashed here in Las Vegas. If you would like to learn more about the various attempts to crack the mystery, we have additional links on our website at lasvegasnow.com. And in the same fashion, I please highly recommend that you go watch this Project Unity video. I've got the link down in the description below so that you can go watch the full thing. But here you've got that, you know, he get Ross gets challenged here. And so he's like, people are going to question what I'm about to say. And then this is where he drops the bombshell, but he won't say where it's at. Personally, everything that I've heard and seen, I believe that the UFO that Ross is talking about is in Greenland. I think that it is in a location in Greenland. I've heard other people reference to Greenland, but he says that it's so big that they put a building over top of it. And he goes on and on to, you know, make sure and drive the point home that people are going to try to debunk it. They're going to try to say that he's full of it and he's got this smile on his face. He never says or admits that he knows where, he says he knows exactly where it is, the exact GPS of where it is, um, but he doesn't say. I'm telling you, if I know where a UFO is, I think there was an, a structure under Mount Wilson Ranch and potentially under Skinwalker Ranch that's been accessed multiple times. And I would flat out tell you, right? So I don't know why Ross is waiting. If he knows where one of these is, he should tell us as a journalist. But he's trying to say that this craft is so big that it can't be moved. And he references Grush. He's talking about the meta materials. He's like, well, where did they get all this from? And where did all that money go? And this, again, sounds like the same echo, the same story that happened uh, at Mount Wilson Ranch, that there's these structures or alien objects or material underground in locations that's so big, they can't do anything with it. So people often ask if there's a UFO under Mount Wilson Ranch, why would they sell this to Jeff? Why would they just sell it off? Well, that's what Ross is saying is that some of these are so big and Jacques Vallée talks about it in his books as well, that you can't do anything about it. And so they have to put these monitoring systems over top of them, build structures over them, keep an eye on them from a distance and basically leave. And there's also times where it talks about these UFOs going inert or almost like they're asleep. And so they just keep an eye on them and leave. Or is this part of just a secret program that they're using UFOs and as, as an excuse to go install this technology underground in these locations, these missile defense systems and radar systems, and they use UFOs as a cover to shift that money and that budget around. So the whole thing is fascinating and interesting, but I highly recommend that you go watch this Project Unity interview as well. I have also received messages and phone calls about a giant UFO in an indigenous village down in the jungle in Mexico that I've been asked to go look at in 2024. That is all still to be continued. We've covered a lot of ground in this video, so I'm gonna let you chew on all of that. Please go check all the links down in the description below where you're also gonna find access over to my Patreon page where you can get 
inner circle access and also credit at the beginning of all my videos as a direct supporter to my research and the work that we do. And you're officially a part of the team and help me get the equipment and go on the trips that I need to get the job done. You can also go over to the Mount Wilson Ranch Patreon page and come visit the ranch yourself or even hire me and Jeff to come and show you around. You can look at the evidence so that you don't have to wait for the Beyond Skinwalker Ranch season two show that's coming out where the History Channel came back up to Mount Wilson and filmed two more episodes uh, after season one when we found so much cool evidence in the snow, they wanted to come back up uh, when the weather was clear and we had some mind blowing results. So if you want to get all of the behind the scenes on that and the inner scoop, make sure and go follow those links. All right, you guys, I appreciate you guys hanging in for this big video. I know it's a lot to try and absorb, but hopefully it's going to send you down a rabbit hole and open your mind to maybe how all of this is connected. We'll see you guys in the next one. Or could it be manipulated purposely by people who have the technology to uh, simulate UFO sightings. And mm -hmm. people say, well, of course not. Who would do a thing like that? Well, I would remind you that during Watergate, during the Watergate investigation, it was discovered that there was a plan uh, originated in the White House to uh, surface a submarine off the coast of Cuba and paint the second coming of Christ over the island of Cuba using holograms. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> which is well within our technology today. The idea was that since there is a large Catholic population in Cuba, uh -huh. they would be so upset by this vision that this would saturate the communication channels, you know, the telephone system in Cuba, long enough for an invasion to take place. How interesting. I never heard of that. Well, I think that's uh, you know, a classic in psychological warfare, but mm -hmm. that kind of uh, manipulation is, mm -hmm. is well understood. and. I have personally investigated several apparently you know, genuine UFO cases where there was in fact a manipulation. My, my conclusion, the conclusion of scientists working with me, was that there was in fact a manipulation taking place and that it was not a hoax on the part of the witnesses but a hoax on the part of somebody much better organized than them. So there are possibly all of these levels going on simultaneously. Today, the, but today, with the current technology, that would be possible. Uh, another one we put on a UFO and was able to report like he had been abducted. Mm -hmm. you know, in this case where he had not been, but uh, yeah, UFO sightings were you know, popular at the time, particularly the abduction scenario. So that was one where, again, changing history uh, could cause a, a, a new scenario and be able to describe the situation just as if it were real. Was it, was that an experiment or was that, was there a practical use for that? No, no, it was, yeah, <laughs> it was an experiment. Uh, a lot of this was, I, I mean, it wasn't consciously what we set up to do. It was more serendipitous. Here's the events. Uh, who are we working with? What can we do? Who wants to, you know, we were literally making it up as we went along. Dr. Bernard explained to her teammates, she'll recover very nicely. Excuse me? Asked the beard. You're getting technical again. Uh, a simple form of lobotomy, she said curtly. Colonel Trent nodded. Yeah, that's good. In any case, she's no threat to Allentel from here on. But what about Borodine? It's all under control. We've resumed the voices in his head, said Beverly, and I've got him back on his regular medication. The man in black nodded, satisfied. He walked over to the aliens and patted one of them familiarly on the back. Good work. Sit down, cool off. I'll call General Bushnell to report, and he'll be glad to know that this phase of the operation is over. That's good said one of the little aliens who sat down, crossed his legs, and lit a cigarette. Maybe I'll get some time off. I haven't had a fucking vacation in three years. The other alien stretched grotesquely and held his misshapen head in both hands. Then, with a single smooth motion, the dwarf removed his alien mask. <laughs>